our first speaker will be Jan, who I think I can say has a huge passion for BPM and everything connected uh, with it. He is a person open to new ideas and uh, also to discussion. So do not be afraid to ask anything um, that comes to your mind during this uh, whole speak of Jan uh, and also respond to his uh, inquisitive questions. So Jan, welcome and uh, I give you your uh, time. Thank you, Mihaela. And let me share my screen first. And yeah, I hope you see my screen right now. Yeah, I can see it. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, ahoy, everyone. And thank you, Mihaela. I am really honored for the uh, first speech of the day. Uh, greetings to UCT Prague. And yeah, thank you, Mihail and Tomas, for the invitation. Uh, I want to avoid a boring presentation at all costs. Therefore, I encourage you to ask questions uh, during the presentation. And as Mihail has said, you can write the questions in the chat. And I will try to answer them immediately. If not, we will go back to the questions in the Q&A part. Here is the agenda for today. Um, first, I will make a short introduction. Then I will speak on three pillars of digital transformation, which I believe are the most important and crucial for um, our businesses. Therefore, we will touch upon the processes and I will connect definitely it with business process management as this is my expertise. But then I will go further and speak about why SMEs are important. SMEs are small and medium businesses. There I will give you a short introduction of German uh, SMEs and Czech SMEs, what they do have in common, and connecting the digital transformation pillar, business process management, and SMEs. I will give you some digital transformation use cases from our clients for you to understand how these concepts can be applied in real life. And at the end of the presentation, we will definitely go for a Q&A session. So please uh, feel free to ask your questions. As I mentioned, I will talk what I preach and practice daily, uh, given that our topic is digital transformation for SMEs. And don't worry, I only have 20 slides and two of them are done right now. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jan uh, and I am a mechanical engineer uh, by my first, uh, by my bachelor's and first master's. Uh, I have overall 15 years of experience. I was working in uh, engineering projects where I involved in a digital transformation project as a technical uh, consultant. So I was representing the engineering side and little by little, we started to develop software where we digitalized our engineering processes. Processes like maintenance, processes like uh, request management, visitor management, Back then, I was uh, involved in the management of uh, office areas. And I liked the transition so much, and I see the benefit how a little shift to digitalization can ease my daily uh, engineering work, how it can increase efficiency, how I can go back to data, learn from historical data, and apply it to my predictive maintenance which I will talk in the use cases as well, uh, that give me the passion for digital transformation as well as digitalizing uh, business processes. Um, therefore, I established 360 Digital Transformation and exactly on the same topic, I host the Digital Mitterstand podcast uh, in YouTube where we talk about 
the challenges of small and medium businesses. So Mittelstand is the German word for small and medium businesses. And yeah, uh, finally, uh, I am a triathlete and I raced um, in world championships 2019. It was in Shamorin, Slovakia, and I from Berlin, I drive through whole Czech Republic. And yeah, this is a yeah, this is about me. We can go further with the my definition of three pillars of digital transformation. But please let me know in the chat if you think uh, what, what are the most important factors for digital transformation uh, for you. Uh, for me, uh, it's of course the three pillars which I will speak very soon are the most important ones but there is two prerequisites there are two prerequisites to that therefore we will talk about the prerequisites first and then we jump into the three pillars but before we start what is digital transformation at all it is a shift in the company's mindset starts with the questioning the status quo so what we are doing right now and change the way the business operates, which means what we'll be, we will be doing in future and how we will be doing this in the future. To understand this, let's dive into the uh, prerequisites. The prerequisites of digital transformation for me is needless to say, it all starts with purpose. If you don't know where to go, it doesn't matter which people you hire, which processes you have in place, which technology you use, it will end up in, in an inefficient way. Therefore, first things first, companies should start by defining their digital purposes. What do I want to achieve with this digital transformation? What are my goals? How can I make my business better? So, uh, therefore, this step is followed by defining the strategy. You know, it's always purpose, strategy, plan and act. Then you can always refer back to the strategy, refer back to the plan and what you are exactly doing and optimize it, which I will talk uh, very soon. But at the same time, the companies should question their digital business models. Therefore, uh, I would like you I would like to introduce you the business model canvas. Uh, I also did my MBA uh, after eight years uh, in the business and this gave me some business perspective and entrepreneurial approach. So I definitely am coming from the engineering side, but I also have the vision of um, a business person therefore i really would like to introduce you to the tool uh, it's called the business model canvas and it is a framework for value proposition so as i said there are prerequisites to digital transformation first is of course the digital purpose and second one is your value proposition Unless you have a clear value proposition, again, it doesn't matter uh, what you do uh, or how you do it, because at the end of the day, it all comes to the value proposition and how you create value for the clients, for the customers, for your business partners and for your employees. At the end of the day, those stakeholders are defined, uh, are going to define uh, your success uh, as a business. Therefore, I always use the business model canvas, all of my business ideas or businesses that I am in, and even for uh, my personal uh, goals. So uh, it helps me to understand business as a whole. Therefore, I have a bigger perspective while uh, doing the stuff. And it is at the same time makes you grounded in the business and think in the business terms without going too far and going for really crazy moonshot ideas. And if you like, of course I can send you a PDF of a business model canvas. 
and you will have it um, with you as well. But the the best part is you print it, print out a big paper and you uh, play it with the uh, stickers, you know, the post post uh, post its, and because it's so dynamic, you can always uh, make a make a entertaining approach to it. But before we, uh, I show you the business model canvas. As an engineer, uh, and, and we were discussing with Mihaela before, as an engineer, we always focus on the optimization and the cost reduction. And I, I did that as well, uh, almost like 10 years. And it took me a couple of years to change this mindset slightly into the business pr perspective as an entrepreneur. So it makes me think, how can I create more value? How can I... Uh, increase my revenues and how can i create new revenue streams for example with digital transformation therefore right now my shift is like my focus is like 80 percent focusing on the revenue side and maybe 20 percent of the cost side so uh, i would love to hear your opinions on this in the q a because as we are coming from uh, almost all from the engineering side so it, it will be a, a good discussion definitely let me move to the business model canvas first of all i take this example Jam three. sorry sorry we have we have very interesting question in chat Yes. Uh, should the companies focus on their vision or mission during understanding of the digital transform? It's a definitely yes. So let me go back to the slide. And the purpose is defined by the company, of course. But then the mission and the vision uh, here I describe as the strategy. Unless you have a clear strategy, you uh, will be doing things for the sake of doing, or it will be coincidence. But if you have a strategy, then you can plan clear execution and iteration uh, basis so that you know where you have started and you know what you are testing. It's all about testing. And as engineers, we can grab this quickly because it's all about the data and how uh, customers react to these, uh, let's say, new uh, business model, how customers uh, are satisfied. Do they, uh, do they measure, uh, do we measure the, let's say, the uh, retention rate? So there are uh, KPIs and metrics, so indicators that we can track, and it's all based on this data which we use for our experiments, however, in the light of our strategy, which is defined in the mission and the vision. And I hope this uh, answers the question. Thank you. And thank you for the question. So, again, um, Let's read this canvas. I, I took it from internet and I will share my own opinions as well. But this starts in the very middle. You start in the middle, then you go right and or left. But the most important part, as I said, is the value proposition. And for me, this is a bit uh, nitty greedy definition of Tesla. For me, the value proposition is so clear. It's a, it's a modern design car, it's cool as hell, and it is environmental friendly. Of course, then you can add, it has autonomous driving capacities. Uh, you cannot charge Tesla every, anywhere, but charging possibilities are uh, way more cheaper because you can charge it with your solar panels at home, considering the fact that uh, the photovoltaic panels are expanding uh, too much. But let's stay focused and let's stay in the value proposition so this is a canvas as i said you can put post-its on and see uh, what is your pro value proposition uh, let me quickly explain the right side and if you have any questions or if anything is not clear we can always go back to this in the q a uh, but first from value proposition I always go to the customer segments because I think after the value proposition, 
this is the most important part because it's the customer segments or as we call it in um, business like personas so who are my ideal clients who have my money in their pockets so to say uh, so in the tesla case it's of course uh, green buyers uh, i don't agree with high net worth individuals but it could be Elon Musk funds, definitely. It could be mid-tier management. It could be corporate executives. But the more you know your customer better, uh, the efficient that you can create channels to reach these customer segments, relationships to reach these uh, or to build with these customer segments. For uh, for Tesla example, it could be special events with Elon Musk or yeah, Elon Musk blog or Twitter even could be a channel for uh, customers. Whereas a regular car would have a dealership, but Tesla sells it online. So for Tesla, it's more relevant when they have the website. And here you can see which revenue streams you can create. And for me, that's the uh, third, third most important part. So we define the value proposition. We know our customer segments and how we can create revenue from them. And all the other things uh, come later. But again, most important, you list our uh, key partners. So who do I make business with? If you are a BPM consultancy company, then your key partners are BPM software vendors. Your key partners are other software vendors that you integrate with, you might have an integration with SAP or other ERP solutions. Uh, so those are your uh, key partners. And of course, key activities would be like business process management design, process optimization, process automation. So everything around processes. Uh, and of course, the cost structure. I am not underestimating the importance of the cost. However, I am over emphasizing the importance of the revenue here. So this is a tool that I use for my businesses. And as we now have the value proposition and the digital purpose, and after that, of course, the value, uh, so the strategy, so the mission and vision uh, are defined, then we can move on with our uh, three pillars of the digital digital transformation. So, how many of you uh, have performed or saw a consumer journey mapping? If not, I will explain it a little bit. Please, but write me in the chat. Because uh, don't forget, it's not about the answers we have. It's about the questions we ask to understand our environment better. So our customers, our partners, our employees. So it's all about the questions. Therefore, I will start with a question in the beginning uh, of every pillar. And for me, the most important question we can ask is, how can I make my customers and my employees' life better? Because digital transformation starts with people. Of course, uh, people is a very wide term that includes culture. You know the famous saying from Peter Drucker, culture is eats strategy for breakfast. So yes, we defined our strategy, but unless we can foster a growth mindset, a mindset shift in the company towards digital transformation, we will never ever be successful although we have the best processes or best technologies available. For that, we need executive sponsorship, which means on the C level, uh, on the top level, uh, they will be willing to support our digital transformation projects. However, this is not enough because we definitely need a bottom up approach, including our employees, including the people who actually does the processes. So if it's a production company, you might, it might be so wise to include the people who are doing the um, installation or production because they are uh, doing this de facto work and their uh, contributions, feedback might improve our uh, processes. 
and also other stakeholders like our business partners, like uh, our in investors, if that's the case of a startup, or uh, of course our customers. So the earlier we get the customer feedback, the better for us, uh, needless to say. Only when we understand this, then we can move into uh, our second pillar. And I, I think this is the <laughs> we like the most and it goes interesting from here on. Hopefully it's the processes. How can I create more value by optimizing and automating my processes in order to make my customers and employees life easier. But let me reread the question again. How can I create more value by optimizing and automating my processes? So uh, starting with people and mindset shift, uh, we can choose motivated people amongst the uh, C-level management, amongst the mid-management, amongst um, our team leaders, product managers, installers on the, on the shop floor. But by including those people, uh, what we tend to see and what works at most is to run a process discovery. So for us, coming from the business process management background, it's a very straightforward process so that you understand the different um, steps, tasks, activities in the process so that you can optimize with them. But to expand it into um, a cultural shift, we need to include more people and we need to be a bit innovative about the classical approach to business uh, process discovery so that by running customer journey mappings. So what pain points my customers have, what pain points my employees have, getting the data from these uh, mappings in Implementing it to our process discovery, we will see that which tasks can be eliminated, which tasks can be automated, which tasks can be optimized. Because let's assume that your process was designed five years ago and right now, maybe during these five years, something has changed and some activity in your process is not relevant or needed anymore. But as a habit, people keep doing it. We see it a lot in our clients that they print out a document, they sign and they upload it again, which creates a digital <laughs> trash in the most kind words, but we really need to question, do we need this signage with, with pen and paper? Do we need this signage at all? Maybe right now the law or the requirement has changed. It's okay to only approve in the software or in the process that we design. Because when we ask these questions, do we really need it? So what? Do, why do we do this? So what? We really get the answers. It's like we always been doing this like this. We didn't think about whether we can change this. But generally, what we end up with is, yeah, it's okay. We don't need to sign on paper. We can e-sign it. Great. So uh, one painful step. So print, it, print out a document. Uh, sign and scan is eliminated, for example. And or we don't need to uh, scan or assign, sorry, sign at all. Then maybe just an approve button will work. Or this by building a business rule, let's say purchases under 500 euros, don't need to approve of let's say CFO anymore. So uh, BPM can decide this easily so that uh, an unnecessary approval from CFO, CFO would be, uh, of course, uh, eliminated. So in turn, which will 
uh, give us give us uh, more efficient and uh, quicker uh, process. Uh, and uh, you know, there is a favorite quote from uh, like five or six years ago. It's a CEO of Telefonica, a big German um, mobile company, and he said, "If you digitalize a shitty process, you will end up having a digital shitty process." And it's still correct. Therefore, I always say first optimize, then uh, automize. So uh, first we need to optimize our processes, then auto automation is really easy with the technology that we have uh, available uh, on today. So yeah, going on. Okay, we have two other uh, questions in chat. Yes, please. How difficult is to convince employees for digital transformation? How to explain the pros and cons? It is really difficult sometimes, depending on the company culture. If the company seems a little bit traditional, which we see a lot in SMEs, so family-owned companies as well, because as I mentioned, they were doing these things for the last 40 years and they still want to do the things in the same ways. But I think the most practical step here that we can take is including them in the process, including them in the discovery, including them asking the, the, them questions or maybe in the consumer journey mapping, can you uh, de de define your typical day or let's run through this process together. What do you think, what could be optimized? So sh shifting the coin, flipping the coin and uh, asking them questions like what could be optimized, I'm sure they would want to, and that's our experience, they want to come up with an answer. They cannot say, no, I don't know, or nothing can be optimized, then they would feel awkward or useless so that they want to contribute. And those those underlying points where they say, yes, we could actually do this, or yeah, we have done this 10 years with the paper and signature, but we could maybe eliminate this. So that's one thing that I do most. So ask them questions, ask them what could be done better, what would they have done if they were me? Uh, and of course, it's a change management. Change management is always starts with resistance. They will resist. And then uh, there is a point of acceptance. And then it's like a curve like this. So resistance, acceptance, and then they understand the benefits. So uh, the pros would be definitely make them the understand the benefits and the cons will be definitely the resistance and of course uh, the the older uh, the company culture the more resistance you will get not the people i see sometimes 50 55 year old people an accountant uh, normally they seem like they are doing a boring job but when i explain the benefits they are like hey let's do it because uh, it comes from inside it comes from the individual's mindset. However, uh, overall, it depends on the company culture. Thank you. And the second one is, is the optimization same approach like finding wasties in processes in lean management? It is very, very, very similar. I actually love the lean management and I used to uh, apply the principles on my own work like 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and, and actually here there is a great book from Eric Ries. Uh, it's called The Lean Startup. I encourage all of you to read this book. I read it three times and I reread it all the time because I always find useful information and this is exactly uh, about your question and thank you for this great question which in turn take the lean methodology 
and apply it into a startup culture and startup environment. So I see the small and medium businesses uh, like the new startups because they need to change. And uh, with, with these principles, as I said, measuring what's relevant. For example, uh, measuring what's relevant uh, brings the counter argument uh, useless metrics. Let's say as a business, you want to create you want to create um, a LinkedIn channel to increase your sales. How many posts you produce per day? How many likes or views you get per post are useless? It doesn't matter if you measure them or not. What you could measure is how many customers you get per post, how many um, inbound sales requests or how many presentation requests you can get per post or how many of the comments are leading you to, uh, let's say, a demo or uh, presentation. Then you can also make it a court analysis like how many people I approached, how many of them were interested, how many of them did I make a demo, how many of them were interested in the demo and go with the contract, how many of them I lost in the negotiation and how many of them I signed with. So those kind of uh, metrics that are really has the outcomes direct impact to your business. Remember the business model canvas on the revenue revenue stream that you should be measuring. And I think um, by reading this book, you will have way more uh, information about the lean management and process optimization. At the end of the day, it's all about uh, optimizing your processes. But how would you know that you optimize your processes with these uh, useful metrics? Thank you, Jan. You're welcome. Yeah, and then um, the, the, the third pillar is the technology. When we define uh, the people and started a mindset shift, then when we optimized our processes accordingly, the question would be, which technology will help me to achieve my goals for uh, to make my customers and employees' life better and to create value for uh, them by optimizing our processes. Don't forget, and this is the quote from Bill Gates, technology will only magnify your processes efficiency. Uh, I changed it a little bit, but you understand what I mean. And let's take a great example uh, of robotic process automation, RPA. I know you all, all, all know that by mimicking uh, human actions or by following a regular pattern, robots can do a lot of works. Let's say you copy from one Excel and you paste it into ERP system. This is actually a straightforward job, right? A robot can do, the, do this easily. But if the process is inefficient by itself, the way you do it, the robots, because they will make it faster than you, will make it more inefficient because it's lose of time at the end of the day. However, going back to the second pillar, if you have already made your processes efficient as possible, then robots will take this efficiency and magnify this. So you will reach your goals faster. Therefore, it's so important to understand this before choosing the right technology. It could be an RPA tool, it could be a, a business process automation tool. Uh, they call it when combined with artificial intelligence, so intelligence automation, but it's all about the names. They are all buzzwords and it doesn't matter uh, how they call them. What matters is do, does the technology that we choose serves our uh, goals defined in the first and the second steps. That's uh, the most important thing because I really hear a lot from our clients, a CEO or CTO, uh, here's a technology uh, and he or she is convinced about the benefits, which is great. So we don't need to 
explain them the benefits of digitalization or digital transformation, DTM, RPA, whatever. So it's great, but they want to go with the implementation before they really go through the first and second steps. And then our goal is like, hey, great, you hear that, you know what you want to achieve, but let's first go to the prerequisites, then the first step, including or establishing the teams, and then go with your processes, please. Then uh, let's choose the technology. And in fact, it could be the RPA, so the uh, technology that exactly CEO heard of. However, without a, uh, in, in the BPM terms, without a uh, brain, a BPM orchestration, an RPA would also not make sense, uh, but it on its own. So we are running a little bit out of time, so I will be uh, even uh, quicker, but we will still have some time for the Q&A, so please ask questions if you have any. Uh, before uh, we jump into the use cases, I would like to say it's a continuous improvement. Uh, if, if you will, with one highlight today, I kindly ask you uh, to make this this one because uh, digital transformation never ends. It's a continuous improvement. Therefore, we need to test new business models. We need to monitor progress and don't forget those progress would be the KPIs that you really have outcome, uh, have a specific effect to your uh, bottom line, to your revenue channels. Uh, so, so that so that you understand how this affects your business. Getting the customer and employee feedback all the time. And please beware that I never split these two because your employees are as important as your customers and keep optimizing. So this is a continuous improvement. And, and actually in the uh, quality management, there is a process for it. It's called continuous improvement process. And that's the exact reason why I choose the logo of 360 Digital Transformation with uh, round uh, circles and arrows because it's a continuous uh, movement. I'm moving slightly uh, quicker here. Why SMEs are important? Uh, in Germany, they are more than 90% of all the companies and they employ 60% uh, of the workforce. And if you consider the big giants, the enterprises, there are only 28 companies from Germany in Fortune 500, whereas 48 of small world market leaders are German Mittelstand, which is incredible because if you think uh, it makes to almost 1,500 uh, companies of 3,000 companies in the world, they are small world leaders, by that I mean, let's say, world leader in a niche product like drilling bits or uh, floor coverage. Uh, and they employ a really small amount of people, but from a town in Germany, they could be a market leader, which I believe it's very, very, very important for us to understand. But the same goes for Czech Republic, because Czech SMEs create 50 5% of the total uh, value-added products and employ even more than German, uh, like almost 70% of the workforce. And which is very important in, in the Czech domain to say that between 2013 and 2017, the increase in total value-added products by the Czech SMEs increased almost 20% which shows the potential, how significantly they are increasing. But this was, the, in English, the latest information I could find. And if you have any updated information, please uh, feel free to uh, send it to me. And yes, uh, I would tell a little bit of like uh, two more minutes about the use cases, uh, because SMEs really don't care about the technology. At the end of the day, they care about how the digital transformation will impact their business. Is a digital uh, service catalog would increase their customer satisfaction, partner satisfaction, therefore save time and money at the same time. So as we have um, six, six uh, more minutes, uh, my idea is to send you this uh, slide deck 
and we can go uh, further right now with the Q&A and I can definitely uh, answer your questions if I haven't done any uh, in the in the emails or uh, afterwards you can send me any. Of course, uh, uh, I am not afraid of spiders and I love wine, but please uh, feel free to ask me um, other questions. Do we have any questions, Mihaila? Thank you, Jana. We uh, don't have any yet, but uh, you can also raise your virtual hands and uh, speak to us directly if you want to. And also our participants were interested in your podcast. Uh, they were asking, is that it in English? Yes, yes. Um, you can con connect me on LinkedIn and you can subscribe to the Digital Mitterstand YouTube channel. That is in English where I interview the experts and try to bring different perspectives uh, like how the new work can be applied to the SMEs, how business process management, uh, process mining, robotic process automation, so new technologies can increase the efficiency or save time uh, or money or create new business models like uh, creating a digital twin of your product which might in turn decrease your costs and increase your customer satisfaction. Also, uh, I try to host guests from methodology side. So how we can create the change management? How can we apply agile? What is digital purpose? So all of the things that I try to uh, squeeze into this 40 minutes talk that I go over in the in the YouTube channel and before then um, I close I will definitely send you this uh, PDF deck and you will receive it before I close we also uh, organize an entrepreneurs fuck up night where experienced entrepreneurs uh, speak about their failures I believe in the failure culture and we learn more about from our failures than uh, our successes. Therefore, uh, experienced entrepreneurs, they always speak. This is all also in English on May 13, 6 p.m. Berlin time. And they are going to speak about their uh, failures and how they fucked up. And we as uh, other entrepreneurs can learn from their experience. I highly encourage you to uh, join. And before I close, yeah, uh, I would say uh, Jacqui and this is my email address, this is the website of my company and I'm uh, so glad to have this talk here and would like to thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, we have one new question. Yes. <laughs> Which country, or maybe you can say countries, are number one in digital transformation? Well, I would say Germany is <laughs> not number one, not number two, not number three, not four, not five. We are, I, I'm living in Berlin, therefore I can talk about Germany. But I lived in Russia and of course I am from Turkey, so I lived in Turkey. Uh, I could speak about those countries. But um, let's say the vaccinations showed us that uh, countries like UK, US, they are very ahead of other countries like Germany or um, Austria, Switzerland, because uh, they are good with action so that they could um, realize their digital transformation goals. However, uh, I always give the payments example. For example, in, in Turkey, you can pay with your uh, mobile phone without any hassle. Uh, in, in Russia, very interesting, I could even pay with my watch, smart watch, uh, in the tram. Uh, so the, the tramway. Uh, in Netherlands, there are cashless places, though they literally don't accept cash. You can pay with card or uh, other online methods that I mentioned. So th those things 
actually reflect the digitalization uh, matureness level, so to say. And in Germany, unfortunately, we have <laughs> no credit card ac accepted places. So uh, I would answer this question in, in a way that uh, unfortunately we are not there yet. Therefore, it's my passion because I see the potential is huge, especially with the traditional companies, traditional uh, small and medium businesses, so that they have a big potential to use the power of technology with their know-how because they are great at what they are doing and create uh, create a way more value, value than they are doing right now. So uh, by this, I will say thank you. I think I'm over my time and thank you for listening and have a great day.